Uh, Mark Fenningstein is the, uh, excuse me, CEO and co-founder of BRD Motorcycles, whose, web whose website is fasterfaster.com. How did you pick that? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> some of you might know that I am uh, myself um, quite an enthusiast of motorcycles and when I invited Mark I had a uh, secret hope that he would bring a sample to test but I guess he failed to do that. Uh, <laughs> Mark is a former student at uh, Dartmouth. He's got his uh, degree in fine arts and engineering in 01 and he also completed the MEM program here at Thayer School in 04. Uh, BRD is a uh, San Francisco based electric vehicle company that recently launched the Redshift uh, line of motorcycle and uh, Mark has worked in different places including venture capital, strategy consulting at BCG and uh, at, at Frog Design uh, creating product, software and services while teaching his clients how to innovate. Uh, please welcome our speaker. Thanks. Um, great to see this big of a turnout. A uh, quick show of hands. Um, how many folks are engineers or engineering students? Oh, OK. Um, business students? No. Other? OK. Uh, and how many folks have ever ridden a motorcycle? All right. New Hampshire loves motorcycles. I, don't, um, I would have thought it too cold, but it's uh, all about living free and sometimes dying. Um, <laughs> So this is the redshift. Um, when we get into production, this will be the first production electric vehicle to be faster than the gas equivalent, car or motorcycle. First production street vehicle of any kind that's faster in its electric form than it is in gas. And that's a pretty unique moment in, um, in transportation. Um, we built this bike um, on a shoestring budget. Our team is. Uh, now five people. Um, at the time that we were building it, it was only four people. We developed our own drivetrain from scratch. Um, the level of sophistication in this drivetrain is actually beyond what's in the Tesla Roadster. Um, and um, when it does go on sale, it'll sell for about $15,000, which um, is kind of at the upper end for motorcycles, but pretty, pretty economical in the grand scheme of things. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we did that and where we're headed next and why we picked the space that we did. Uh, I want to leave more time for questions than for me pitching my bike to you. Um, but I'm going to start by sharing a little video just so you can get to know us and the team. We're a little bit different than a, a typical, especially Bay Area startup. Bye. 
So that's it. Four guys in a machine shop in San Francisco. And, um, and we built this bike. And so far, it's done everything that we hoped it would do. It's actually done more than that. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about why motorcycles and why it makes sense for electric vehicles uh, before I get into the actual design and engineering of our bike. So um, common misconception is that developing a new product and innovating is all about finding an unmet need. And sometimes that is the case, and especially in developing nations, there are lots of unmet needs and uh, no shortage of, of ways to solve those. In the developed world, most of our needs are met. Um, there isn't really much that we have to do or that we, we have to do and we can't. Um, in the developed world, products are, sell much more based on want and desire. Um, I use the Motorola Razor, which is slowly becoming outdated, but it's the example I know best, so I'm going to share it anyway. Um, it was a, a product that was completely irrational, and it never would have been developed in a normal corporate process. Um, the projected market size for it at the time it was being developed was a total of 5 million units worldwide. No one had ever heard of a, of a $500 phone, let alone a $500 phone that didn't have very good functionality, um, but it did look pretty. They, they sold 5 million of them in England in the first week. So um, they the projected demand for this sort of thing was really low because there wasn't a need for it, but there definitely was a desire for it. And that's an important lesson um, whenever you're considering a product for markets that have everything they want. So I can't wait for the transportation market to transition to electric, but I don't believe that there is a good reason for it to transition to electric just yet. I'd, I um, would love for us to reduce our carbon output. I'd love for us to have a cleaner uh, way of getting from A to B. But um, batteries, to be honest, aren't that great just yet. So when I look at a product like this, which is a pretty incredible piece of engineering, and so is the Volt, and, and um, I'll leave Tesla out of this for a minute because I think they agree with me. Um, but there isn't a rational reason to buy this car. It um, certainly not an economic one. And even in terms of, of carbon and, um, emissions, it's, it's sort of a wash, and it, it depends on how you look at life cycle analysis. Um, for practical purposes, it doesn't get you from A to B any better. It doesn't haul any more than the gas equivalent. And so um, it really leaves neither a rational or irrational desirability reason to, for a purchase. Um, so when, in 2009, a friend of mine at Frog Design said I needed to meet these two guys who'd been working on an electric motorcycle and help them uh, evaluate it as a business, my immediate answer to her was, well, I'm going to tell them that it's a terrible idea and they shouldn't do it. Um, even though I want electric to win, I don't think it, I don't think it can succeed. I think uh, my thought at the time was, if you buy a, a vehicle like this, you are making an admirable but charitable contribution to the future of electric technology. You're catalyzing that, and that's great, but recognize that that's what you're doing. Um, however, uh, when I met these two guys, and, and the first words out of my mouth were, this is a terrible idea. Um, when I met them, uh, two things happened. Um, the first was they showed me a picture of the first generation design, which is a little bit different than the one I showed you. But nonetheless, it was beautiful. And um, there are a couple of, of truths about designing products for the developed world. And one of those is that all rationality goes out the window when you dangle something pretty in front of people. Um, and so that worked. Uh, that, that got me to ask the next questions of, tell me more about this bike. Um, they had stumbled upon something really interesting. There, there are some niche spaces where electric actually does make rational sense. Uh, an example is urban scooters. So you can build a really low-cost scooter 
um, under $1,000 with a lead-acid battery and a brushed motor. It costs less than a grand. It'll go 10 miles, 15 miles, which if all you're doing is buzzing around, say, Shanghai, that's great. And it's actually the cheapest option, super economical, very low maintenance, awesome. Um, not a great place for an American startup to try to compete because it's a commodity and, and you're competing on cost and there's no sort of design or let alone margin involved in the product. There's also a few spaces like um, fleet vehicles, UPS and FedEx, who have very short, very fixed routes, but they do them over and over and over and over again and, and over a long enough period to actually make up the difference in cost of fuel. Um, what my partners Derek Dorstein and Jeff Sand had stumbled across was a space where the performance demands were really high. The power to weight ratio required by a vehicle was really high. The customer placed a premium on that performance. That is, they were willing to pay for something that went faster and was lighter. But even though it was high power for the weight, it was low energy. So an off-road race bike is somewhat top speed limited because you're off-road. You will run into a rock or a tree or another rider if you try to go too fast. Supercross, for example, top speeds are 65, 70 miles an hour, um, much less than even California highways and for much shorter periods of time. And the race format is 20 minutes long, um, maybe 10 miles long uh, at most. So what you have is a very high-performance vehicle with a very small gas tank. And that doesn't happen very often. Um, these guys had found it because they love dirt bikes. And it's, it's what they were passionate about. And they just decided to see if they could build an electric that was faster than the gas bikes that they already had and that they already loved. And that's an important point. Um, like I said, nobody needs, uh, in, in, at least in this market, nobody needs an electric. But they had found a way to make everybody want an electric because everybody in this space wants to go faster, especially than their friends, and especially than their friend that is slower than them and they know is slower than them, but is suddenly faster than them because their friend bought an electric. Um, so it's, for us, it's the perfect starting point for electric vehicles. Uh, it's, it's a rare space where you can demand a premium, which you inevitably have to demand because batteries are expensive. Um, you, have, it's, you have high performance demands, so you have a platform for developing very high-end technology. And we all know that eventually, over a long enough period of time, the space is going to transition to electric, um, but we're waiting on this battery tech. Well, we don't need to wait on the battery tech. We can develop it now. We can get it into market now. And we can actually start selling product now, and we can help catalyze that movement. <clears throat> um, another interesting thing happens. Um, so we have these off-road bikes, which are a really obscure niche. High-end, race performance, off-road bikes. And um, so like, oh, that's you know, not a very significant market. Um, it is a great place, though, to build rabidly passionate customers because they care so much about th this bike. It is their hobby. It's what, it's what they care most about. Um, and so if we can deliver that performance, they love it. But another thing happens with this type of bike is it turns out, and this is pure serendipity, I won't claim strategy, um, that a, an off-road motorcycle is a great platform for an on-road bike. And that sounds counterintuitive, right? You, you should have a better bike if you start by designing it for the application. Through some weird quirks of motorcycle chassis dynamics um, and a long history of motorcycle design being driven by artisans rather than engineers, people really didn't figure out that a tall, lightweight bike actually handles faster on the road than a low, heavy bike. Um, and the, the quirk there is the height. You wouldn't expect a taller bike to be faster, but it turns out it is. It has to do with the roll center of the bike. Um, so despite a longer wheelbase and slacker steering geometry, um, an off-road bike on on-road tires will outhandle a traditional sport bike, you know, the fully fared ninja style bikes, um, to a point. It's at low speeds, um, low speeds and tight courses, something like a city, something like uh, a goat trail or a secondary road, um, a go-kart track. This, uh, this type of bike would be the fastest thing you can buy. Once you get out on the highway, big open road, 
everything changes. Um, so not only do we have an off-road bike that uh, is the fastest, arguably most desirable thing in the category, we also can have an on-road bike, and this genre is called supermoto. In this case, it's in police trim. It ends up being the perfect urban patrol vehicle. Anywhere where police officers are using, say, bicycles, horses, or dual sport motorcycles, crowd control, ballparks, parades, um, it's a perfect application for that. <clears throat> and then there's also the, oh, whoops. Ah. Uh, I love PowerPoint. Microsoft is my favorite. OK. So another really interesting thing happens. And we didn't, again, being completely honest, we didn't realize this until we got into it. Um, these race bikes require a huge amount of maintenance. So one of our assumptions getting into this was, well, the electric's going to be more expensive. We know it's going to be more expensive. Let's make it worth it. And we do that by making it faster and more fun. What it turns out, though, is, is that the bikes that we're going up against, um, the version from Honda, for example, requires three-hour oil changes. So every three hours of, of use, you've got to change the oil. Um, every 18 to 20 hours, you have to do a valve check, maybe a valve adjustment. Uh, every 40 hours, you're rebuilding the top end. You're replacing the piston, the rings. You're rebuilding your engine. Um, and if you're not doing that maintenance yourself, the costs add up pretty quickly. When we ran the calculation, we discovered that even being really, really conservative about the maintenance cycles, so ignoring Honda's recommendations of three hours and only changing the oil every six hours, ignoring their valve adjustment of 20 hours, only doing it every 60 hours, our bike actually ends up being significantly cheaper over a typical life of a new motocross bike, which is 200 hours of use. After 200 hours of racing, the bearings are shot, the chassis rattles, and generally people get rid of their bike to someone who has to rebuild the whole thing and replace every bearing in there. So, um, and, uh, so we end up, like I said, about $2,000 cheaper over that life cycle. And we're penalizing ourselves pretty badly. In terms of um, resale value here, we assume after 200 hours, our bike is worth half as much as retail, which is the same assumption we made on um, the Honda. But then we also assume within that half as much, the battery itself is worth half as much. So we're, we're subtracting twice just to make sure that we're really conservative about what these used bikes will sell for. And we still come out ahead. So what we end up with is a bike that is not only faster, I'd argue prettier, but actually cheaper. And so now we, we have a, a, a product that can sell based not just on the irrational and the passionate, but actually on the rational and the economic. Um, again, something that hasn't happened in the electric space before. So let's talk a little bit about the technology, because I think the vast majority of hands were engineers. Um, we, uh, like I said, developed our own motor, our own internal gear reduction, our own battery pack. We don't do our own battery cells. Um, our own battery management system, our own ECU. We also developed our own chassis, and I'll get to that one in the next process. Um, one of our advantages and disadvantages is, like I said, we're four people, now five. Um, our engineering team consisted of one other Thayer guy, David Drennan, some of you might know him, and um, uh, another founder, Derek Dorstein. Derek basically engineered this entire system himself. Um, on the one hand, that's really challenging, one person taking on an entire drivetrain. On the other hand, it is great for systems level engineering and systems optimization because you have one brain that gets to manage all of those variables at once and you're not constantly communicating back and forth. So if you're trying to optimize all of the parts as a system and you're iterating through it many, many times, if you can get one person to do that instead of two, let alone five, um, you have a huge advantage. So um, the magic in our system is that it is optimized for power density and it's optimized for the range of speeds that street-going vehicles see. Um, our motor 
is a PMAC motor, and PMAC motors have existed for a while, and they're used in all kinds of applications. But what Derek found when he first got into this and was trying to find an off-the-shelf motor to just stuff into a, a Honda chassis was that those motors were designed for other applications. And, and the firms that specialized in, these des in designing these motors were better at designing them for other applications, like aerospace or industrial applications, where they tended to run in kind of a fixed range. Um, almost all electric vehicles have run into the problem where the motor is usable over a much broader range of speeds than a gas motor, than an internal combustion engine, but not quite enough to completely cover the range of speeds that the vehicle sees uh, without using a transmission. And everybody wants to get rid of the transmission because the transmission is just kind of a nasty, heavy, high maintenance tool that you use to try to make a gas motor work over a broader range. Um, and if you use off-the-shelf electric motors, you kind of need a transmission also. We wanted to eliminate it. Tesla took a similar approach eventually. Um, so what we ended up with was, you've probably heard a lot about how electric motors are torquey. And they are, depending on how you look at it. Um, we didn't need torque. We needed usable speed range, and we needed power. So we have a very small diameter, very high speed motor which means it functions from 0 RPM to 12,000 RPM, which means that even without a transmission, our motor functions over the same range of speeds as a gas bike with a 5 or 6 speed transmission. Our bike will run from 0 to 100 miles per hour, and it will be faster than the gas bike in every gear except first gear. Um, but in first gear, you're actually traction limited, not rear wheel torque limited. And in drag racing, generally, the gas bike has won for the first two feet, and then our redshift has beaten the gas bike over the remainder of the distance. Yep. The other piece of technology that we ended up developing is this. This is our chassis. Um, when we got into this project, uh, I've mentioned we have a machine shop uh, that's my partner Derek's machine shop, he's owned and operated for 10 odd years. Um, between Derek and Jeff, they've been building things in sort of machine shop, hundreds of units kind of sizes for a combined five decades. Um, they're good at building stuff, and that was one of our advantages, and we wanted to make the most of it. We actually initially thought we were going to bootstrap this company. With a machine shop on hand, we figured we can start building bikes right away and get them out the door and kind of work our way up. That, that ended up being too ambitious, but what it meant was instead of designing a vehicle that could only be manufactured in a giant production plant at 50,000 units to be profitable, we designed a bike that um, could be profitable about 1,000 units a year, and one that we could build in our own machine shop in the middle of San Francisco. Um, that generally makes potential investors run screaming, because uh, not only do we actually want to build a thing, we want to build the thing ourselves. We don't want to outsource it. And we want to build the thing ourselves in California, in San Francisco. Um, but the reality is we have that manufacturing capacity. We have that expertise. We've designed this frame ourselves. There's nobody on the planet that's better at building it than we are. And so we're going to use that to our advantage. So let me talk a little bit about this frame and, and what it does. Um, there's a longer blog post on this, uh, if you're curious, on the site. Um, if you look at the history of motorcycles, they came from bicycles. It was a natural evolution. Uh, we have this two-wheeled thing. Now we have a motor, so we don't have to pedal it. We'll stuff one into the other, and we'll go. Um, essentially, every motorcycle chassis, with a few concept exceptions along the way, is an evolution of that. It's uh, a frame fabricated from a collection of first tubes and lugs, then tubes and forgings, then maybe some tubes and some extrusions and forgings, but an assembly of metal welded together. And those eventually got very, very sophisticated and very optimized. And if you look at the latest frames, they are very lightweight. But they're also really hard to build because it's an evolution of a system that, that started with artisans and welders and fabricators. Um, a company like Honda has gotten very good at that. And they have huge teams of very skilled welders. But in the absence of that, it's a really hard way to build a frame. And there's a question of, well, we haven't really taken a second look at that in 100 years. Maybe there's a better way to build a frame. 
This frame doesn't have a weld on it. It's uh, made in two parts. It's a pretty sophisticated casting, and the casting is designed to be machined in a single fixturing. So we get the frame as two castings. We take that casting, we clamp it into a five-axis horizontal milling station. 12 minutes later, we have the rear piece. 10 minutes later, we have the front piece. Um, now, on the one hand, that does eliminate a lot of the labor. So it doesn't take as many jobs, as many hands, to build this bike. Uh, but the bright side is we're able to build it here, locally, domestically. And um, we, we have, in addition to just sort of the feel-good aspect of keeping the manufacturing in the US and finding ways to actually bring manufacturing back to the US, it means that our design team and our marketing team can be co-located with our production team and they can learn from each other. And when we engineer things in the future, we'll take the same philosophical approach of thinking of manufacturing first because the people doing the manufacturing are sitting right next to the people doing the engineering. And I think that's one of our biggest sources of innovation. Like I said, my partners have spent their careers building stuff. And because of that, a really unusual aspect of our approach to design and our design strategy was once we, we sort of did the basic number checking of is this thing going to be fast enough? Is it going to go far enough? Is it going to be light enough? Once we did those basic calcs, the next question we asked ourselves was how are we going to build it? And that's normally a question that doesn't get asked until well after a concept stage, after some design validation, after some customer interviews. For us, it was pretty much the first question we asked. And it meant that when we built that prototype that you saw, that prototype was already built with manufacturing in mind. The very first bike we built, we already knew how it was going to go to production. Um, and that means that we launched that bike this past August. Um, if all continues to go well operationally, we hope to ship the first bikes before the end of this year. It's a pretty fast development cycle, especially when you're working with a team of five. So, um, oh, come on, there we go. No? Yes. Okay. Uh, so that, that manufacturing-driven approach, um, what does that get you? We love Mission Motors. They're right down the street from us. These are some awesome guys. There's a bunch of Dartmouth folk there as well. This bike is an incredible piece of engineering. It's um, the first electric sport bike to start to threaten gas bikes. It's not quite there, but it's also not very far from it. And it's, it's really quite impressive. Um, they're not going to build and ship these bikes because building one of these would be in the neighborhood of $100,000 to $120,000 at retail. Now, architecturally and technologically, it's a really similar piece to our bike. Um, they, they've ended up coming up with some very similar solutions to the challenges of electric drivetrains and packaging that, that we did. Um, but they picked a different market space, these full-size, high-speed sport bikes that need to go for long distances. And they didn't start with the premise of how do we build it, how do we build it in a cost-effective way. And so, like I said, our bike comes in at 15 grand, and this one comes in at 120. You end up with an order of magnitude difference just from picking a different market segment and not considering manufacturing up front. So um, that's uh, one of the big lessons. However, these guys are, are now doing great. They're, they're um, focused on technology licensing and tier one supply. They're selling their drivetrain. They're getting great traction. We're definitely cheering for them. And um, yeah, great collection of folks. So what's the bigger picture? Because we still have this kind of quirky niche bike. We're pretty convinced that everyone who actually wants one and buys one is going to love it. But we also know that there's not that many of that people. It's kind of an obscure toy for wealthy Westerners. Um, which is where a lot of new technology starts, right? Uh, fancy phones, airplanes, helicopters, you name it. Um, a lot of this stuff starts as toys for the rich. One of the other nice things about focusing on off-road bikes in the US is that our, our drivetrain is about the equivalent of a 250 cc, a highly tuned 250 cc gas engine. So displacement, this is all 
This makes sense, right? A quarter of a liter. Um, if you look at the rest of the world, uh, the rest of the world who uses motorcycles as utility vehicles, not like in the US where they're, they're purely toys, most of those bikes ridden by adults are in the 250 cc range. So what is a kind of obscure, high performance, and really small drivetrain in the US is the perfect drivetrain for the rest of the world. And um, some interesting things are happening in the motorcycle space. Uh, the motorcycle space went through uh, a few of its worst years in 07, 08, 09. There we go. Um, in the US especially, motorcycles kept getting bigger, kept getting heavier, kept getting chromier, kept just getting louder. Um, and uh, it was largely because Harley Davidson was focused on one specific segment of customer and just wanted to keep delivering more of Harley to that customer. Um, Unfortunately, it was a customer that many couldn't afford the $25,000 bikes that they were buying. But uh, the other unfortunate thing is that it wasn't bringing any new people into the fold. And, and motorcyclists kept getting older and older and older in this country. Um, but that's not because motorcycles are undesirable to the rest of the population. It's just because no one was giving the rest of the population the bikes that they want. And globally, we're urbanizing, right? As a species, we're urbanizing. People keep moving more and more to city. We're only going to become more concentrated in cities. So you have manufacturers that keep producing bikes that are designed for the open road, for easy rider, for Route 66, for really long, straight stretches of highway. That's not very useful to a young city dweller. And what you, we started seeing is that all over the, the world, from Bali, to Indonesia, to New York and San Francisco, young riders are buying bikes from the early 70s rather than buying new bikes. Um, one might argue that they're buying them because they're cheaper, but then those same buyers at, uh, end up spending another three, four, five thousand dollars on those bikes, making them their own. And so it's definitely not a matter of economics. Um, bikes from the 70s were smaller. You could buy a 350cc bike instead of a 1700cc bike. <laughs> and they're more compact. They just work better in cities. Um, they're not so loud. And so we're seeing kind of a new paradigm, and it's the right time for small bikes to make a comeback, somewhat in the US, but especially globally. And it's not just in what I would call the lifestyle space, where it's sort of half fashion, half function. Um, it is also in the sport space. So this is part of the story I was telling earlier. You have these traditional sport bikes, big fully fared machines that are designed. Top speed of 186 miles an hour, uh, close to 200 horsepower out of this Hayabusa to the right. Um, that is not very useful for going block to block in a city. And what we're seeing instead is the bike I described earlier. People taking an off-road bike that does very well at low speeds, that's still incredibly quick and really high performance, and they're putting slick tires on it, and they're ripping around the city, and they're turning these cities into their playgrounds. Um, not that we would condone it, but these bikes are amazing in that they can go over stairs, retaining walls, cars, children, <laughs> you name it. And so you have a, a whole younger generation of riders that are reinventing the sport, and they're reinventing the sport around small, lightweight vehicles. Um, the last thing that's happening, and this is really specific to off-road, is that off-road motorcyclists, and nobody thinks of off-road motorcyclists as environmentalists. They do do a lot of lobbying work to keep riding areas open and to keep it wilderness, but um, we all know that as off-road motorcyclists, we are much maligned by the rest of the environmental community. And we also know that our motivations are not so pure. Um, the, the result of that is that off-roaders keep losing riding area. In Europe, off-road riding area is almost gone completely. And they have a long off-road motorcycling tradition. So even though off-roaders really don't care about electric, in fact, some of them downright hate the idea of electric, they love the idea of keeping their riding areas or even enabling new ones. And um, 
so you have an audience in this space that um, loves noise, loves gasoline, revels in the idea of burning fossil fuel. They bathe in it. And I literally have seen people wash their hands with gasoline after working on a bike. Um, but a small and growing set of them are begging for electric because their favorite riding area is under threat, and they know that this is something that can keep their hobby alive. And so that is it. <laughs> That's the bike. Um, thank you all. And uh, hopefully I've left plenty of time for Q&A. I've had some conversations earlier today, and they've been tons of fun. So I'd love for everyone to stick around, and let's, let's have a conversation. Oh, actually, sorry, I have one more thing. I knew I had a, a grand closing, I almost forgot, which is the bike in action. Um, so the, the two folks that I, I think you're talking about are my two business partners. We're building the bike our, ourselves. Um, so we, we haven't had to go through the process of bringing it to people and asking them to build it for us. We will build it out of our machine shop, which we're slowly converting into our production facility. And that's not true of every component in the bike. We'll do the chassis in-house, and then we'll do final assembly, QA, paintwork, and that sort of thing. Um, we're not going to fabricate boards ourselves, for example. But um, the components that we do bid out and send to third party are, are in formats that 
there are pretty well established supply chains. You know, there are folks that specialize in building the board of the size that we want in the, the quantities, and it's a, it's a pretty standard RFQ process. Is that what you were asking? This first bike will use an off-board charger. It's a pretty dumb charger, though. Most of the intelligence behind the charging is built into the bike. So the battery management system is built into the battery pack. And the, the charger itself isn't completely stupid. I mean, it's not just you know, two wires coming out of the wall. But um, it's, uh, it's a fairly cheap piece. And what that allows us to do is, one, keep the weight of the bike low, because this one is a performance machine. Subsequent models will probably have will probably integrate that um, into the bike so that you can charge wherever and you don't have to carry that around with you. The other thing is that it allows us to have different sized chargers. So the bike will come with a five amp charger, and that will take a good four and a half hours to charge the bike from empty to full. Um, but with a, a fifteen amp one ten charger, um, it it won't go twice as fast, but it'll it'll charge significantly faster. You could charge two bikes off of that if you needed to. Um, and then um, with a 220 system, it takes about two hours to charge. So it allows us to modularize that system a little bit better, depending on what folks have in their home. On the prototype bike, do you plan to do anything to manage rear wheel spin? Yes, um, quite a bit, in fact. So, uh, so I should say, a, a really um, another really risky but interesting part of the process of, of, that we took was we skipped two to three normal prototyping steps. A normal process would be to build a test mule that's hideously ugly as a proof of concept just to make sure everything works and learn from it. You might build an aesthetic model that doesn't function at all but looks pretty. Um, you might build a version of kind of combining those a little bit, and then you'd get to the step that we did, which was a fully functional, fully aesthetic model. We skipped all of that. We went straight to a fully functional, fully aesthetic model. Um, it was a huge risk. It, uh, it, it was a little easier to manage because our team was so small. So we, weren't, again, weren't coordinating through as many teams. But it could have gone wrong. Um, it didn't. That, that bike is the one that you see running, and it runs really well. But you can't get everything right. And you also know in advance there's a few things that you know you're not going to get right, and so you, you plan for. And um, throttle response. Uh, and wheel spin and engine braking were three of the things that we just didn't know enough to know exactly how they were going to function. Good news is, is all that can be managed in um, software. I'll caveat that by saying we are really opposed to the idea of traction control. Part of the, the joy of recreational motorcycling is the connection from the rider to the rear tire, and that's what skill in motorcycling is all about, having perfect control over the rear tire. Um, and we feel philosophically like traction control is the bike taking over that for the rider and doing it for the rider. However, giving the rider the best possible feel for that traction, we feel like that's in play. That's what, that's what, soft, what it should be doing. So we're OK writing more software if it's giving the rider more direct control. Um, so one of, the, one of the, the things that cropped up is the an, rotational inertia in the system is far, far lower. So one, the gyroscopic forces are lower. And that's great. It means at 40 miles an hour, the bike transitions really quickly. But the rotational inertia of the system means that the bike, the rear wheel spins up much faster than on a gas bike. Um, add to that that we don't have a transmission. Remember, we work over the full range of the bike. So not only does it spin up fast, but it spins all the way up to the maximum speed of the bike. Right? If you spin up a tire in second gear, you'll hit the rev limiter, and it's only going to go as fast as second gear can go. On our bike, that, we, that rear tire is going as fast as sixth gear can go. Um, so you'll lose all traction immediately. It, it's, it almost sounds instantaneous. It goes from to like that. Um, so we, we have now built in an algorithmic flywheel effect. 
so that the rear wheel can only accelerate at a, a certain theoretical speed that's a little bit faster than the bike itself could ever accelerate. It you know, takes into account wheel slip and, and that sort of thing. But it's, um, it's sort of a set rate. It's not the bike intervening. It just means that the, the wheel will only ever accelerate a certain speed. Similarly, with, with engine braking, that's one we actually want to leave variable. We've played around with zero engine braking, so the bike coasts. And uh, for most of the testing, especially when we let someone who isn't part of the company ride it, we, we have a sort of moderate amount of engine braking, less than, say, a four-stroke um, twin, uh, but similar to a race bike with a slipper clutch. So there, there's enough to kind of settle the bike. Um, I suspect that as the paradigm shifts, people will go to zero engine braking at all. And will also probably go to a left-handed rear brake, which sounds like complete blasphemy to most old-timer motorcyclists, but um, is the faster high-performance setup for a couple reasons. And I can go into that, but it's kind of obscure if you're not super interested in, in it. Did that, did that answer it? Here. You very briefly mentioned Mm -hmm. Which must have been curious given your product and its potential market size. So where yep. are you in your investment cycle? Uh, if you're ready to write a check, I'm ready to take one. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, we are still um, pursuing investment. We'll need more money to ramp up our, our production. And then even once we get into production, we kind of immediately want to expand and go global. Um, I sort of hinted at it, but I think our bike is actually better suited to global markets than US markets, even though we have a great following here. So there are, there are still a couple of stages of growth, and we'll need outside money to achieve that. Um, the, the investment side has been interesting. We're, uh, we're not a typical startup in a number of ways. And um, I, the, the challenge isn't so much that people don't like the idea of manufacturing. It's that there isn't much expertise left in manufacturing, in, especially in the investment community, and people invest in what they know. And so uh, even if they love the product and, they, and they've ridden the bike so they know we're not lying to them, um, it's, it's a scary proposition to go against everything they've heard, which is that you can't build stuff in the US, let alone build stuff in California. And um, it, you know, it's not their area. Uh, eventually, we, we, have, we have found those select folks that came up through building stuff. Uh, but it took a long time to find those folks. And, and they really do get what we're up to, why it works. And um, oftentimes, they also have kind of the same philosophical reasons for wanting to see it succeed. Yes? This one? Um, yep. Uh, so we have, depending on where you start counting, um, we have seven moving parts in our drivetrain, not including sort of standard motorcycle parts, you know, swing arm, rear wheel, chain, not counting every link and, you know, each ball in the bearings, um, but about seven major components versus a four-stroke gas engine, which even a single cylinder has dozens of moving parts. You get up to a four-cylinder, you're talking hundreds of, of parts. Uh, that is part of the reason we were able to do this with such a, a small team. The, the building building a, a, a drivetrain like this is a subtle challenge, but it's actually not a com that complex of a challenge. Um, I don't in, no pun intended, but there's not that many moving parts, and. Um, if, if we were, say, trying to build a passenger vehicle, there's no way we could have done it with a team this small. One of the really nice things about a motorcycle is it's basically a drivetrain plus wheels. We don't have to design an interior. We don't have to design a body. We don't have to design windshield wipers. We don't have to design crumple zones, any of that. So it's the perfect platform if your goal is to either just 
build motorcycles, but also to develop drivetrain tech. You don't have to be distracted with all that other stuff. And that, that proved to be a really expensive and big challenge for Tesla. They had to kind of learn from scratch how to do interiors, how to do exteriors. In the end, it's, it's resulted in a lot of intellectual property for them. They're doing some very innovative things in the interior, but that was a long and arduous and expensive process for them to go through. And we don't have to deal with any of that. Uh, so many questions. Yes. <laughs> Yep. We, we have entertained the idea of, um, of selling the drivetrain independently. Um, we probably will not do it for a few reasons. One is we built that chassis out of necessity. If, if we could have hit the performance that we wanted to by putting our drivetrain into a Honda or a KTM chassis, we definitely would have done that. Right? We didn't. We didn't want to engineer anything we didn't have to, which is actually part of the reason why our bike is very conventional from the swing arm pivot back and from the headstock forward. Suspension, brake components, chain, sprockets, all of that is very standard because we didn't want to re-engineer that. That stuff works really well. Um, so I think the retrofit market is going to suffer from the same problem, and they're going to end up with compromised systems. And we don't really like the idea of people being disappointed in our drivetrain because the retrofit didn't go so well. Um, so I think it's unlikely, uh, although, I don't know, like maybe a motor to DFR or something like that, if it fits their applications. You know, th those sorts of things I could imagine us doing, but I don't, I don't see us really commercializing um, the drivetrain system as a retrofit. Yeah. Um, so philosophically, what we're doing is, is really a continuation of what Tesla started with the Roadster. I think they felt the same way about, um, about utility vehicles, about economy vehicles being electric as, as what I described, which is that it, it doesn't make economic sense, and even the environmental case is, is somewhat marginal. So with the Roadster, I think they, they knew two things. One, that these vehicles were only going to sell as emotional decisions. And two, that the industry really needed something sexy as a halo product to attract folks even to products that are less emotional and more practical. Um, so a lot of credit goes to them. We, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if they hadn't started that four or five years ago. Yeah. Um, the, the basic steps are build out a test fleet to make sure we get enough hours on the bike. Um, we already have a list of hundreds of incremental adjustments and changes. Um, you know, no major changes. We got things 90% right, but that last 10% is a long list of little things. Um, so we have another iteration uh, to, to build out um, as a test fleet, and then from those bikes we'll tool up uh, our first production run, we'll keep ourselves as demo bikes, and then we'll start doing test rides around the country. Um, but it's also sort of a last check to make sure that these bikes are really ready for consumption. And then bike, bikes will roll off the production line and ship to dealers. Mm -hmm. What's the expected lifetime of your battery pack, and what's the cost of replacing it? Ah, it's a doozy, <laughs> doozy. Um, I'll give you the bad news first which is that the, the battery will retail for $7,000, um, which uh, it hasn't come up yet, but I usually get the question, why don't you have a quick change battery? And if the $7,000 doesn't explain why we don't have a quick change battery, then the fact that it's 85 pounds and the idea of changing one of these things out by yourself in the mud next to a racetrack seems a little scary when you're holding $7,000 that you can drop and break. Um, that was. Uh, our initial design, the one that Jeff and Derek first had when I met them, was quick change. And we realized that that was probably a bad idea. We were able to eliminate a lot of weight, a lot of packaging space, and a lot of cost by going to a fixed battery uh, under the realization that no one's going to buy a spare battery for this bike. So back to life. Um, it's engineered for 
um, about 1,000 hours or 50,000 miles, uh, which if you're used to pa passenger cars, sounds really short, right? If you go by a Taurus, you expect it to last at least 100, if not 200,000 miles. Motorcycles, um, with the exception of the big touring bikes, really very rarely see more than 25,000 miles. And if you're talking about an off-road bike, um, the battery life is probably five times longer than the chassis life, just from the abuse that the chassis sees. So that's another great reason why we would want to start in a space where the vehicles are <clears throat> excuse me, used over short distances. Um, it does, which is uh, par uh, part of the reason our, so our battery has actually three mechanical layers of protection. Um, the cells themselves are encased in a kind of multi-layered aluminum block. Then there's airspace to the carbon Kevlar cover that you see in orange. And then there's more airspace to the skid plate. So it would take an impact that would destroy the rest of the bike before before you'd actually puncture a cell. Um, but it's still a concern, because that, that um, is a fire hazard and, and an expensive accident to have. Um, so far, we, we have crashed the bike, and the battery has been fine in that crashing, but that's definitely going to be part of the testing regimen as we work through this summer. Um, the location of the battery, motor, gear reduction, all of that was part of Derek's optimization process to get the center of gravity in almost exactly the same spot as it is in the gas motocross bikes. Um, going back to that we didn't want to re-engineer anything we didn't have to, there's a hundred years of refinement in a modern motocross bike. And they, ha they handle really, really well. Um, and we didn't want to risk handling worse. So we basically have matched the chassis geometry, center of gravity, all of that to um, the state of the art in the gas space. So that's why the battery has to be there to get that center of gravity right. Is that air cooled only, or is it liquid cooled too? Is it all the battery and the motor? It's liquid cooled. Uh, the motor and motor controlled, um, or inverter, depending on your vernacular, are liquid cooled. And uh, the radiator actually sits inboard of the front frame rails. So that, that um, radiator shroud. Uh, usually people are like, oh, you have a fake radiator shroud on an electric bike. That's stupid. No, it's actually, um, it's a functional air scoop, and it, it is pulling air into uh, a radiator. We're, we're pretty excited about that part of the design, because radiators are often the first thing to go in off-road bikes. They're, they're mounted right on the side, sticking way out in the wind, and you tip the bike over, and you puncture a radiator, and your ride's over. Um, so ours is pretty well protected. We air cool the battery, and... There's a couple reasons for that. Um, the motor and the motor control operate at a much higher temperature than is optimum for the battery. So we wouldn't want to run them off of the same system. Um, the the motor is going to be up around 170, uh, 180 degrees. And the battery, we want to keep down at like 120, 130. So um, we, um, we would have to run probably dual cooling systems to liquid cool all of it. The other aspect is, so far, we don't need to liquid cool our battery. Uh, we run a very high voltage system, and we're not stressing our battery particularly hard because of the size of it. So um, through some kind of clever air cooling, passive air cooling methods and, and architecture of the, the pack itself, we've been able to keep the temperature in range, at least so far in testing. Um, it's, it's a hard problem. Uh, and so we, we have, we've defined equivalency ourselves, sorry, as weight and power. And so we're at 250 pounds, 40 horsepower, which is a touch heavy, also a touch powerful for a 250, um, but certainly not in the 450 range. Um, 
still, we don't expect to be sanctioned for a point series AMA supercross race, uh, just because even if you try to develop an equivalency from electric motor to gas motor, it's not a fair comparison to either of them. Our limitation is battery, not motor, um, especially in a supercross format where you tend to use throttle in bursts of a half a second to a second tops. We could tune our motor up to 55 horsepower. Um, it, the limitation is how fast it generates heat. And so if you're only using like burp, 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 you know, bits of power, um, the motor will easily put up 55 horsepower, putting it in kind of the 450 range. But you'd run out of battery. And so we don't yet have a good way to develop an equivalency. It's not as simple as two strokes to four strokes was. And I know there's still some debate about that, but you know, you're at least sort of apples to apples. Um, but what we can do is exhibition racing. And we know what a credible race is and what good riders are and what a good track is. And um, if, uh, if we can get the bike onto a real track under good riders and run those exhibition races, we'll be pretty happy with that initially. Um, and hopefully, within the next few years, we'll figure out a good solution to actually to, to get it into point series races. But I don't have a great answer for it right now. I would like to see <laughs> anyone who's interested 